Hello everyone, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. In this lecture video we're going to be moving on to something very special called moments. Now in the first three weeks we've basically covered two things. The first one is forces and in week one we talked about 2D forces and in week two we talked about 3D forces and then finally in week three we discussed applications of these forces using particle equilibrium. So up until this point everything has been focused on force vectors. Now at the very end of particle equilibrium I said well this is easy because all the forces act at the same point. If everything acts at the same point well things are just going to translate. Everything is pretty simple. Now at the very very end I said well don't get too comfy. It looks nice now but it becomes a little bit crazier later and that is in situations where all the forces do not act at the same point. I said that if we have a beam something like this and I had a force acting at the top and a force acting at the bottom well as we can see things start to rotate. Now that rotation is actually characterized by something we call moments. So that's the whole goal this week is to fam familiarize, I don't know why I can't say that, familiarize ourselves with the idea of moments. At the very end of this course you're going to come up with two things. One is expert knowledge on forces, which we've basically already covered. You guys are good to go. And the second one is going to be an expert knowledge on moments. So that's something most of you guys may not have seen yet, but we're going to discuss it this week. So sit back, relax. Again, I hope you guys are all doing well, hanging in there, and let's begin. So moments of a force. Again, before we've always talked about forces that act at the same point. If everything's acting at the same point, no rotation occurs. However, we said that if forces do not act at the same point, we actually have rotation. Now, the best way to show that is through an example with a box. This is something very intuitive. A lot of you guys know what exactly is going to happen with this box when I start to apply forces. So if I were to take my box and I were to apply force at the very bottom of the box, well, we actually have two mechanisms. The first one is perhaps the most simplest to imagine is we have sliding. So we know at the bottom of this box we have a frictional force that's going to try and counteract any movement I put onto the box. Now if my force that I'm putting on exceeds the frictional force, now friction is something we're going to talk about later, but friction is capped. So if my force that I'm applying exceeds the frictional force, well my box is actually going to start to slide. So that's going to be the first mechanism. Now if I were to take that force and start moving it up the box, we introduce, or we are introduced to our second mechanism, which is going to be tipping. So if the applied force P starts to act at a significant distance above, of course we know that the box is going to tip. And in this particular case, the box is going to tip about a very specific point. In this case, that is called point O. What happens is with this force, we actually created something called a moment because this force did not act through point P. Again, we're now in a situation where we have forces that do not act through a point. Now, a moment is a quantity used to describe the ability of a force to cause rotation of a body about a specified point. So the first key here is that moments are not general. Some moments can be general, and we're going to discuss that in week five, but for the majority of the cases, moments are always specialized about a point. I wouldn't say that the general moment is something, I would say the moment about this point is this, the moment about this point is this, etc, etc. So the moments depend on which point you want to take them about. Now the formula for moments in two dimensions, it's actually really simple. We're going to take our force and multiply it by a perpendicular distance. So the only thing that you guys actually have to remember is that this distance that we're multiplying our force by, it's going to be perpendicular. Now, if I'm taking force and multiplying it by distance, we know that moment's going to have units of something like Newton meters, or if you're in the States, pound feet, something like that. Now, again, the only thing I really want to stress is that perpendicular distance. So if we look back at our figure here, if I were to draw a line through that force, well, we know that that perpendicular distance is simply going to be that vertical distance, which I call D perpendicular. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that specific one. But as we can see, moments in two dimensions, they're actually really simple. Uh, this week, again, we're discussing moments of a whole. So we're going to go from 2D to 3D. The 2D moments, very simple. This video, hopefully it's rather short. 
But when we get to next week, 3D moments, or I guess the next video, that's where it starts to get a little bit more complex. So if you guys are saying, Clayton, this is pretty easy. I'm having a great time. Well, good. I'm glad you're having a great time. But don't get too comfy, too comfy yet. It's the next video where shit starts to get real. So before we get into 3D moments, let's talk about something called the principle of transmissibility. Now, this is actually really nice because it helps answer a lot of questions I find students who are experiencing moments for the first time have. Now, what this principle actually states is that if a force acts along a rigid body, the effect of the force is actually the same throughout its line of action. Now, you guys may be kind of doing that like blinking meme in St. Clayton. What the hell does that mean? Well, it actually means this. Let's say I had this situation right here where I have kind of an L-shaped bar, and I want to take the moment about 0. 0.0. The first thing that students have trouble with is finding that perpendicular distance because they don't really know what it is. And they'll say, if I measure directly from P and go straight up, well, I get my distance to a point, but that point isn't point O. So is this actually the distance that I use? And the answer is yes, because what the principle of transmissibility means is that the effect of this force will be the same along its line of action. So what I can do with my force is I can draw its line of action extending indefinitely, and then it allows for a very easy determination of that perpendicular distance. So as we can see here, the perpendicular distance in both cases is going to be the same. However, students much prefer directly measuring to the point rather than measuring to some random point in the object. So that's all that this is. Now, the second thing students seem to have trouble with is when we take our situation and we apply a force that's at an incline, something like this. Now, there's two things that can kind of happen here. The first is students will go, okay, well, I know that the perpendicular distance is going to look something like this, and I can solve that through trigonometry. Well, of course you can. You can definitely solve this through trigonometry, but I'm going to be honest with you guys, don't. It starts to become quite time consuming, and again, the name of the game in exam type scenarios is speed. Remember the cars from Disney? I am speed. That's what you guys should be doing right before the exam because you guys want to try and finish as fast as possible. Now, how do we counteract this? Well, the easiest way is to actually use vector components. So what I can do is I can take my situation that I have here on the left and I can say, well, that's actually the same as this situation on the right. Now, this is actually very nice because if we look at force PY, I can extend it up using the principle of transmissibility, and then I can say that my perpendicular distance is simply going to be dx. And I can do the same thing for component px. I can extend it using the principle of transmissibility, and then I can find that perpendicular distance dy. Now the question becomes, okay, okay, moments, simple. All I do is take my force, multiply it by a perpendicular distance. Yes, that is it, it is simple, but there's one last thing to keep in mind. Moments are vectors. They're just like forces. They are vectors. And remember that vectors have two things. First is the magnitude, which is going to be the force times the distance, but they also have a direction. Now, when we talked about forces, we said that vertical forces, for instance, if they're going upwards, they're positive, and if they're going downwards, they are negative. Well, moments follow kind of the same type of logic, where if we have a counterclockwise rotation, we say that it's a positive moment. And if it's a clockwise rotation, we say it is a negative moment. So this is in 2D. Counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, how exactly do I tell if it's going to be a clockwise or counterclockwise moment? Well, the best thing I do in exams, and I, I was uh, kind of a very proud uh, <laughs> instructor when I walked through the exam and I saw a lot of students doing that, is I just use my pencil. So for instance, if I'm looking at PX right now, and I want the moment about O. What I would do is I would hold my pencil, and where I'm holding my pencil, that is going to be point O, and we know that PX acts horizontal. So if I were to come through, as we can see, my pencil here starts to rotate clockwise. Now, if I were to do the same thing for PY, again, I'm gonna take my pencil, I'm going to hold it at the point I want to measure, and then I'm just going to apply the force. PY, in this case, goes upwards, so once I start pushing my pencil, we can see that it starts going counterclockwise. So that's what I do. It's very simple and it's nice because in the exam, you have your pencil ready. It's very, very quick to kind of do the rotation. If you don't have a pencil during the exam, well, I'm sorry, but uh, I think you got bigger problems to worry about than to try and find a moment. 
So if I were to take the moment about point O using these two components, I would get the following equation for my moment. It'd be negative PX times DY. So again, the force times the perpendicular distance. And again, when we did the moment, we saw that PX was clockwise. Therefore, we have the negative sign. And then we go plus PY times DX. Again, for PY, once I did my moment, we said it was counterclockwise. Therefore, it's going to be positive. So it's that sign convention you guys need to worry about. Other than that, moments are actually that simple. Now, the whole goal of this lecture is to, just to introduce you guys to moments in 2D. After the midterm, so weeks maybe 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, like basically everything after the midterm, we're going to start talking about applications of moments in 3D. But I just want to show you guys one really quick so you guys can start to get a sense of why this is going to be important moving forward. So the first and kind of the big application is moments in equilibrium. Moments allow us to add a third equilibrium equation for 2D scenarios, which is going to be the following. Remember before we said that the summation of forces in the x direction and the summation of forces in the y direction, those must be equal to zero for our body to remain static. So we had two equations, we can solve for two unknowns. Now in general equilibrium, we have a third equation in 2D, and that is the sum of the moments at any point must also be equal to zero. Now this is great because instead of two equations, we've upgraded to three, which means that we can actually solve for three unknowns now. And you guys may be saying three unknowns. Okay, well, that's that sounds like more work. Well, it is, but it's not too bad in two dimensions. Now, the first quick scenario I can show you that we have three unknowns is this case right here. We talked about this when we talked about support conditions. We said that we had pins and we had rollers. Pins create two unknown forces, a horizontal and a vertical, and rollers create one unknown force, which is vertical. Now, we actually call this type of beam simply supported. And if we look here, there's three unknown forces. So you guys can kind of guess what we're going to be doing in week six. We can use these three equilibrium equations to solve for these three unknown support conditions. So that's going to be kind of the first thing that we do with moments in 3D, or sorry, in two dimensions. And then the second thing that we're going to do, which everyone's going to hate, this is towards the end of the course, and trust me, if I were to ask any student which topic they hate the most, it's always this, and that is friction. What is friction? Well, let's go back to our box example. So we have our nice box. We know that it's going to tip about 0.0, and we're applying a force to this box. Now, the box actually has several other forces on it. So if I were to create a free body diagram, there's other things I have to consider. The first is going to be the weight of the box. It's going to act at the center of the box, and of course, it's going to be pulling the box downwards. If I were to take things like, I don't know, my calculator, and I were to just let go, I, I'm not sure how loud that was, but it drops downwards. We know that things have a tendency to go downwards due to gravity. So the box is going to have a weight. And then at the bottom of the box, there is actually two forces. The first one is a normal force. And this force is basically the reaction of the earth or the structure to keep you guys upwards. Now you guys may be looking at this free body diagram and saying, well, Clayton, you're drunk. Why is the normal force acting way over at point O? Well, what we're actually doing is we're considering the effects just before this box starts to tip. So if I were to take the box and say it's my iPhone here, at a certain point just before it's about to tip, we see that the one side lifts up and all of that weight transfers to the very corner. So this is greatly, uh, this is greatly emphasized, but as we can see that normal force, the only place it now makes contact is going to be with the corner of the box. And again, if this is something confusing, don't worry. This is a topic we are going to be covering later. Now, the final thing we have, of course, is friction. If I push on something and it is sliding, there's going to be a frictional force trying to counteract that motion. Now, if we were to draw a proper free body diagram, we said that there's two things. The first is all the forces, which we now have. But the second thing, of course, is dimensions. So two dimensions that would be very important to us are going to be the dimension D from point O to our force. And notice how it's perpendicular as well as dimension B. So again, from point O to our weight force, and again, it's also perpendicular. So this is why free body diagrams are very important. We talked about them, but we talked about particle equilibrium where we didn't have any lengths. Now, this is why it's so important to include lengths on free body diagrams, because we need to know these distances to create moments. These distances are actually called moment arms. So D here would be the moment arm of P, and B would be the moment arm of W. 
Now let's use our equilibrium equations to try and analyze what's actually happening with this box. If I were to go to the summation of forces in the y direction, so the vertical direction, I have two forces. We have a normal force, which is going upwards, so it's positive, and we have a weight, which is going downwards, so it's negative. And this makes sense, because if I were to rearrange this, it means that my normal force is equal to my weight. And that makes sense, right? If I were to apply a force to my desk here, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, the reaction the desk is going to provide is going to be exactly the same as the amount of force I'm applying to my desk. The second one is going to be the summation of forces in the x direction. As we can see, we have two forces. We have an applied force P, which is going to the right, so it's positive, and we have a frictional force, which is going to the left, so it's negative. So if we were to arrange this, we have P is equal to F. Now, we can actually say that if P is greater than F, we actually have sliding. So this is what we're going to do in the frictional case, is we're going to analyze these forces to figure out what's going to happen to this box. Remember, friction is actually capped. Friction does not go up until infinity. It actually has a certain number. But our applied load, we can start exceeding that frictional force. And the moment we exceed it, that's when the box is going to start sliding. Now, the last one we can do is actually the summation of moments about point O. So if we were to look at this, we can say, all right, there's actually going to be two forces that create moments. Notice how the normal force directly goes through point O. So the perpendicular distance is going to be zero. So the normal force N, that creates no moment. Same with the frictional force. I drew it a little bit downwards, but the frictional force actually acts right at the base of the box. So if I were to draw the frictional force, it goes directly through point O. Therefore, the perpendicular distance is zero. Both the frictional force, normal force, they create no moments. The only two that are going to create moments are going to be the applied force P as well as the weight W. So my summation of moments, I would get the following, where I got negative P times D plus W times B is equal to zero. Now, the only thing, again, you guys have to worry about is going to be those signs. So notice how when I go P times D, that's negative. So if I were to hold my pencil at point O at the bottom and apply my force P, as we can see, it starts to rotate clockwise. Now, I'm not sure if the camera actually inverts this, so I recommend you guys taking your pencil and doing it too but we can see that we have a clockwise rotation, therefore it's going to be negative. If I were to take the weight, sorry, <laughs> P times D, and if I were to move on to the weight, and I were to take that moment about point O, well again, I'm holding my pencil at point O, my weight is going downwards, so I'm gonna go downwards, and as we can see, we start to rotate counterclockwise. So that's why that side is positive. Now, if I were to analyze this case, we have the tipping case. So if P times D is greater than the weight times B, tipping will start to occur. Now this is actually quite intuitive because if we look at this, we can analyze two things, and that's based on the left side. So if we look on the right side really quick, we have the weight, which is going to stay the same. The box is not going to magically gain weight. We got B, which is just the dimension to the midpoint of the box. That's not going to change. So the whole right-hand side it's actually constant, it's not going to change. If we look at the left-hand side, we can actually modify this to increase it so that tipping occurs. We can do it two ways. One, increase the amount of force that we apply on the box, or increase the height of that moment arm. And that makes sense, right? If I want to tip something over, let's say I want to tip my computer over, I'm not going to apply my force at the bottom of the computer. I'm going to apply my force at the top because it's much easier to tip at the top than it is at the bottom. Now, if we were to look at the increasing P, we can say, yeah, increasing P would lead to tipping, but if we increase P, we might actually activate that first case, which is sliding. So that's something to be aware of, is increasing P may not actually make the box tip, it might actually make it slide before it tips. So the best way to make something tip, increase the moment arm. The best example of this, doors. Why do you think door handles are as far away from the hinges as possible? Because if they were close to the hinge, we don't create a lot of moment. Doors become a lot harder to open. If you guys know those like push doors, if you guys apply the force really close to the hinges, it's a lot harder to open than when you guys go to the outer edges of the door. So yeah, that's moments in 2D. Again, the applications of equilibrium. This is something we're gonna be discussing a lot later on, so don't worry about it too much. 
it was just uh, kind of an example to show you guys what's going on and what we're actually going to do with it. The only thing you guys really need to take from this video is that a moment in two dimensions is going to be the force times its perpendicular distance, as well as knowing that a counterclockwise moment or rotation is positive and a clockwise rotation is negative. That's it for this video, guys. So again, this should be nice and easy. In the next video, we are going to expand moments into three dimensions, and that's where things get a little bit more crazy. So uh, hold on, get ready. It's about to get fun. All right. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you guys want some examples, I will have maybe one example down below. Again, this is really simple. I'm sure you guys already know what's going on. Uh, the next video will have a lot more examples for 3D, so do, don't worry. All right. Again, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.